we'll just give people one more minute to log in and then we'll get started. Okay, welcome everybody. I think we will go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Barbara Dennison. I'm with the board of the Friends of Fort Hunter. We're delighted to start off 2024 with uh, our first lecture of this year. And we are delighted to have Julie Riker, who I will introduce in just a second. First, I do want to just give you a couple pieces of information. We do ask that people keep themselves muted and we will be doing muting from our end as well so that there's no interruptions for our speaker. Also, if you have any questions or answers and Julie has indicated she's looking forward to having questions and answers, uh, please type them in the chat function that you'll find at the bottom of your screen where it says chat, just click on that. Type the questions in and we will hopefully get to all of them or as many as we possibly can at the end. Um, so we're going to save those to the end, just type them in that chat function. I'm also going to be sharing there uh, Julie's website, and I've shared the Fort Hunter website. So if you want more information, you can go to either of those locations for information on Fort Hunter programs, information on uh, Julie's work, uh, any, any either or both of those things. And she's also, I think, got that information as well as her social media presence and so forth. Uh, on one of the slides that she is going to be showing us. Mm -hmm. Our next lecture is going to be February 21st. That's uh, a Wednesday. And uh, we're delighted that our own Katie Shimana is going to be talking to us about food preservation, kitchen tips and tricks, and how uh, food and these topics related to food uh, evolved over the two centuries that Fort Hunter has been present and people resided there and so forth and came down to us uh, in the 21st century. So that'll be interesting on February 21st and information to register for that for free will be up on the Fort Hunter site, I'm sure in just a few days. But today we are going to hear from Julie Riker and I am absolutely delighted because I've been waiting for this topic uh, quite eagerly myself. Uh, Julie Riker is a Pennsylvania artist who studied at the University of the Arts in Philadelphia and became involved in the historic restoration of the PA State Capitol, uh, replicating original decorative paintings, stenciling, and applying gold leaf and ornamental plaster finishes. She has had her own decorative painting business since 1996 and specializes in a number of things that you can read on her website and has won a number of awards. Uh, again, too numerous to list here, but you can read on her website. And she enjoys painting outdoors, which is the topic that we have her sharing with us tonight, especially in and around the Susquehanna. So Julie, we are delighted to have you. Thank you, Barbara. <laughs> Thanks to the Friends of Fort Hunter for inviting me to share my love of plein air painting. Um, it's the first time I've done a virtual talk, so just bear with me. I guess I'm gonna share my screen here. Does that look good? Looks okay. Great. Yeah. Um, well, Barbara asked me to do a talk about plein air painting, and uh, it's a pretty vast topic. So there's a lot of different ways you could approach it. 
But since this is a group that's involved with Fort Hunter, I do paint there pretty often, um, as well as along the river. So I thought that would be a good way to focus this talk. Um, well, Barbara already told you a little bit about me, but I'll just elaborate. Um, I am a Camp Hill artist. Uh, I grew up in Mechanicsburg and graduated from Cumberland Valley High School. Um, uh, we lived along the Conned Gwinnett Creek and uh, I remember spending a lot of time canoeing and tubing on the creek. I always loved being near the water. I went to a four year art school in Philadelphia, the University of the Arts and um, studied illustration and painting. It was a great program that focused on the fundamentals of art making. So I had a good foundation in drawing color and design, but it was right at that time when computers were becoming prevalent in commercial art and illustration. And uh, my college didn't bring computers into the classroom until the year after I graduated. So I found it difficult to get a job in that field. Um, I ended up working for a local restoration company that uh, was contracted to uh, work on the state capitol building. Um, they were hiring artists to do meticulous detail work. And I worked with that company for six years and learned a lot about architectural restoration um, and also different paint finishes, um, gilding, plaster work. And eventually I left that job to launch my own business, which I still do today. Um, uh, I provide custom decorative painting for clients. Um, and I also work for, as a subcontractor for home builders and interior designers. Um, a lot of my projects involve faux finishes, murals, wood graining, and special repairs. I've uh, worked in countless homes throughout this area and also churches and restaurants, and I even did some work in the governor's residence. It's been a good way for an artist to make a living. Um, so when the housing market slowed down in 2008, my business slowed down as well, and I decided to take advantage of the downtime to get back into painting. Um, well, I was painting, but it was always for a customer. I just wanted to paint for me. So I took a class at a local art center. Some of you might know Earl Bluest. Um, he was the instructor and he had us paint outside. Um, he didn't call it plein air, it, we just painted outside. And uh, I had never done this before in all my years of art school. Um, it was never mentioned. So um, I was hooked and, and since then I've always made it a part of my life and now it's a huge part of my life. As I continue to grow, my art journey's taken me to some really interesting places and created cool opportunities such as giving this talk. Um, I've taught classes and workshops at local arts organizations. I currently run a figure drawing group at the Mechanicsburg Art Center and um, in the spring, I'll be teaching a six week plein air class with the Harrisburg Art Association. I think it starts the end of April. Um, so when we're finished with this talk, if you think you might like to try plein air painting, you may want to consider that class. Um, at the bottom of this slide, I included my website and social media information. So if you care to follow me, I'll, I share my most recent paintings as well as any information on upcoming shows and classes. I've participated in plein air events and competitions in places such as Florida, Adirondacks, Easton, Maryland, and um, they're usually juried events, meaning you apply um, and they select who will participate. Usually there's uh, anywhere from 30 to 60 artists uh, painting within a designated area, uh, like a town or county, for a week, and it, it culminates in an ex exhibition where um, awards are given out. I've won some awards, and the sales are often really good, but mostly I enjoy um, doing these events because it gets me to paint in a new area and uh, to meet other artists, which is always really nice. Um, Often I see the same artists at different events, so it's like meeting up with old friends. 
I show my work locally at uh, Smith Framing in New Cumberland and also Lebanon Picture Frame Gallery. And I often enter group shows with local arts organizations. Um, I've been fortunate to have my work published fairly often in Plein Air Magazine and Fine Art Connoisseur. With, they're both national magazines. Um, but locally, I've also been featured in Harrisburg Magazine and Susquehanna Style. And I love to travel and paint. I've painted in Italy, Texas, Maine, Florida. Um, I'm excited I'm going on a painting trip to Ireland this summer. Um, but there's really uh, great uh, things to paint in my own backyard as well, um, including the Susquehanna River. Okay, so I thought I should probably explain what plein air is, uh, just in case someone viewing is not familiar with the term. Um, it's a French phrase, en plein air, and uh, it, it means in fresh air or in the open air, or just painting outside. Um, artists have been painting outside probably since they came out of the cave, um, but it became more prevalent in the time of the Impressionist painters. This is partly because paint started to be manufactured in tube form, which made it easier to carry. And also new designs came about for portable easels, which also made it easier for the artists to take their work out of the studio. Um, this picture of John Singer Sargent, who's one of my favorite artists, shows him with an easel that's really just a couple of sticks tied together. Um, so it's really simple design, but much more portable than the large studio easels. Plain air painting allows the artist to see values and color relationships um, more clearly than painting from a photograph. You notice more, and after painting for several years, I realized that noticing and seeing are as important as the painting. And the more I practice it, the more I see. So now I see color nu nuances that I didn't notice or wasn't tuned into when I first started. Then there's the multi-sensory experience as you're out in nature feeling the sun or cold, hearing the sound of birds or running water, smelling the fresh air. So it's a great outdoor activity that attracts both professional painters and hobbyists. And there's social clubs and events popping up all over the place where artists can learn from each other and develop friendships. Okay, there is some equipment involved. Um, you don't need a lot and every artist has their own setup that works for them. I'm constantly tweaking my gear to find the right balance between lightweight and sturdiness, but you do need some sort of an easel. There's several different styles of easels and they all have pros and cons. Um, a lot of people are familiar with the classic French easel. It's like a wooden suitcase with legs that fold up and there's room inside the box to store paints and brushes. Um, when it's all loaded up, it can be quite heavy. I used a French easel when I first started painting outside. And uh, one time I was painting at the beach on Chincoteague Island. It was a misty day. And when I finished my painting, the legs of the easel had swollen up and I couldn't fold the thing. So now I use a metal tripod as the base for my setup. Um, it's great because I can set up anywhere, even, even in the water at the edge of the creek. So you see my tripod here and the wood in a stick that's attached to it with a quick, quick release plate holds my painting. You'll see how it's set up in a future slide. Um, the wooden pallet box hooks onto the tripod legs and opens up to give me a nice, a nicely sized mixing area. I have several other styles, but this is the current one I've been using. Um, it's actually made for me by an artist friend, John Tritt. Um, okay, you'll also need paints, brushes, paper towels, solvent if you're using um, oil paint or water, depending on your medium. A painting surface. Um, I like to paint on linen that's adhered to a hardboard panel. It makes a nice thin rigid support and it's lightweight. Um, that frame underneath the white panel is a panel holder. It's designed to hold two panels face to face with a separation in between them 
so I can safely transport my wet painting back to the car. Um, and then depending on the season, I'll also bring sunblock, bug spray, because you have to be careful about ticks around here, uh, um, and an umbrella. Now this can be for rain, but it, it's more as a sunshade. And sometimes I use a chair. I'll usually stand to paint, um, but if I'm in a plein air competition and it's my third painting of the day, I might sit to save my energy. And then also sometimes I'll sit to just get a lower angle um, if I want to get down low and look at something. Prepare for the weather. Yes, you do have to be prepared, especially if you're painting outside in the winter. I have a big down coat that I've sacrificed to be my painting coat. Um, the front's covered in paint and it could almost stand up on its own, but it keeps me warm. I wear good boots and I like those um, foot warmers that heat up when they're exposed to the air. Uh, the hand warmers are good too. I wear a lot of layers and I overdress. I can always take off a layer, but you know, like when you're standing in one place for an hour or so, you get a lot colder than if you were hiking or skiing or something else with movement. So it's better to be overdressed. In the summer, I'm all about sun protection. So I'll wear a long sleeve shirt and a big sun hat. And uh, if it's not too windy, I'll set up the umbrella. The umbrella gives me some shade, but it's more valuable um, as a shade for the canvas and palette because the, when the glaring sun's bouncing off my painting, sometimes it's difficult to judge the values. Okay, so I also wanted to point out my setup. You can see here, there's the panel holder and the open palette box that hooks on the tripod. And um, the, lit, the lids of the box open up and gives me places to set my brushes and other things. And there's a hook for my solvent can that you can sort of see at the bottom of the photo. Okay, someone mentioned that uh, they were curious how I chose where to paint. Well, the first thing I look for is a safe area. So I'm not gonna paint by myself at night or in an area that seems sketchy, I'll take a buddy with me. Um, also, it has to have good parking. Uh, I see so many great paintings when I'm driving down the highway, but you can't just stop anywhere and paint. So I need to know that I can safely and legally park my car. Public parks and boat launches are generally, generally good places. Um, it's not a good idea to go into private property without an invitation. Sometimes I, I am invited to paint on someone's private property and that's usually pretty nice. In the summer, I'll look for shade, like, like a tree to set up under. And, um, and then an inspiring scene, though this is the last thing on the list here because if it's not safe or if I have to stand in the raging sun, I, I won't paint the scene no matter how inspiring and beautiful it might be. I know some artists who won't take the time uh, to paint if they aren't inspired, but I don't usually make that a top priority. Um, I like the quote by Chuck Close, it's something like inspiration is for amateurs and uh, you don't wait for inspiration. You get busy and the inspiration comes. So sometimes I'll get to a location and it isn't inspiring, but I make myself find something to paint, uh, anything. I figure I took the time to get there, I may as well get the brushes wet. And sometimes, maybe because I, I don't care if it's successful or not, it ends up being a decent painting. Um, I like to paint with other artists and sometimes the places they want to set up, uh, well, I'm not super excited about, but I find something and challenge myself to make it into something. And that helps me to be more creative and to grow as an artist. Sometimes I'll spend a long time scouting out an area. It's, it's kind of like I'm hunting for what I'm gonna paint. I like to look for an overlooked view, something different. When I take the time to explore, I discover new possibilities for compositions. This here's the little greenhouse that sits adjacent to the Fort Hunter property. On the left is a painting from the opposite side of the creek, looking at the house reflected in the water. And then I walked around to the other side and really liked the color contrast with this red maple against the green. 
So it pays to take the time to scope out the area. A lot of times I'll do a tight focus composition as I did here. This I think is the spring house, it's Fort Hunter. Rather than paint the entire building, I decided to crop in on just the window and a bit of the stonework. Actually, it was the colorful stonework that I really wanted to paint here. I think it may be unique to those buildings. It took some artistic liberties with the flowers and added more brightly colored blooms. So I'm painting from what I see to a point, but then at some point in the process, I decide I can make the painting better. That's the creative part. So this just shows you the stages of my painting in progress. I usually start with a very rough block in of the composition with a washy neutral color, just to uh, show the dark shapes. It's kind of like a blueprint for me to then build color on top of. I never draw on the canvas. I don't like lines around the edges of things. So doing it this way helps me to see large shapes. I'll build color on top of the block in by mixing a color that is a general representation of the larger shape. So I would paint like the entire distant tree line in one color and do this with all the large shapes until the entire canvas is co covered. And only then will I go in and selectively add detail and um, some nuances in color and blend some edges. Okay, so here we are at the Fort Hunter boat launch. I paint here a lot. There's great source material here. This was of course after big snow. I love when the sun casts cool shadows on the snow. I also like how the wind had sculpted these snow banks into interesting shapes. This is from pretty much the same location, only looking downstream towards the Rockville Bridge. The river ice was pushed up onto the parking lot. It was really fascinating. Also from the same location, turning and looking upstream, this was a gray day. Uh, so I'll try to capture the light conditions and colors that I see on a particular day. You can see the white dot that indicates the Statue of Liberty. <laughs> so I couldn't see details like an arm or face. All I could see was a white dot and I paint what I see. It's good to revisit a location at different times of year um, just to see how things change. Uh, the, I thought the Forsythia along the bank at Fort Hunter made a nice subject with the Rockville Bridge in the distance. I love the lavenders and cool greens in the spring palette. Here I was on top of Peters Mountain looking towards Halifax and you can see the river snaking around the bend. You probably recognize this building. I wanted to try to capture the backlighting on the church and the glow of sunlight through the fall leaves. Okay, this is a little further down the path toward the Rockville Bridge, but here I really wanted to make the bridge blend into the landscape. Um, so my intention was not to paint a portrait of the bridge, but to have it fit into the entire scene. I did this by simplifying the shapes of the bridge and not adding a lot of detail. There's actually more detail in the foreground rocks that lead you in and point your eye across the river. Same bridge. This is uh, on the other side of the river in Marysville. I was standing almost directly under it with this extreme perspective. It almost feels abstract to me. Um, sometimes I like to play with that line between realism and ab abstraction. Negley Park's a great place to paint. I go here often since I, I live pretty close by. You're up high uh, looking down on the water and you can see a long view way up the river into the distance. It's, it's lovely at dusk and the color of the sky is reflected in the water. I paint here a lot because it's so close to me, um, but it's always different, always a slightly different painting. There's a nice large loose one.
West Fairview is my favorite place to paint um, the Harrisburg skyline, especially in the morning when everything's backlit. It creates one mass shape of skyline and the dome's so distinctive. Later in the day, you see more light on the building, so it has an entirely different feeling. I've painted this view in the summer when the loose strife and mallows are blooming on the islands. And in the winter when the ice is floating down the river. Sometimes I'll try to capture the movement of the water, like these ripples coming into the shore. I like to see the sky color reflected in the water. It brings some of the light sky into the lower part of the composition so there isn't a defined line between land and sky. It's more integrated. It makes for an interesting composition. Sunsets are especially beautiful on the river. It's a real uh, challenge to paint at this time of day when the light's fleeting and changing so quickly. You have to work fast and make quick decisions. It's fun to play with the brilliant colors of a dramatic sunset. This is in Shypoke where the train bridge crosses. It was a hazy day and um, you couldn't really see where the bridge met the distant shore. So I painted it as I saw it. I was lucky that the train stopped and parked for a while. So I added it into the painting. I, I really think the addition of the train makes it a better painting. So that was lucky. The same bridge as seen from Riverfront Park. Sometimes I like to add people to my paintings. Underneath that bridge is this large log jam. I'm not sure if it was created by beavers or if it was just a gradual buildup of logs floating down the river and collecting there. But it's an interesting structure and it was a cool thing to paint. While I was focusing on this, I kept noticing birds flying in and out of the crevices. And I was thinking it must host a, an awful lot of wildlife. I had to throw this one in the Pride of the Susquehanna. It was parked on City Island for the season. And you can see through the arch to the bridge from the previous paintings. I like to paint along the creeks too, as they're all part of our waterways. Along the river, you have a vast open sky, but um, Along the creeks, the spaces are tighter. The compositions are a little more closed in. Sometimes I'll focus on something along the edge of the water or the rocks underneath the water. Again, that edge of abstraction. Nature can be chaotic and I love the reflections. The Conned Gwinnett, it's a very slow winding creek and the still water is almost glassy. I'm always curious what's around the bend. The Yellow Breaches is faster moving and rockier and more shaded, at least the places where I've been going. Um, there aren't a lot of sky openings and the water's really clear, so it mirrors all the surrounding colors. Same location, different day. Not only are the colors and light maybe slightly different, but probably I see a little differently uh, from day to day, or my attitude is different, or I'm more or less confident. It all comes out in the painting. So there's no shortage of material from day to day or season to season. It's a never ending journey to explore and learn. So 
So I want to thank you for letting me share my work with you. And I hope you can find time to do something that brings you as much joy as painting does for me. And that you take the time to see beauty in your own backyard. So now I guess I'll answer some questions if there are any. Stop sharing my screen. Well, thank you. That that was um, just outstanding, and thank and you. we do have um, everything's. Sorry, my screen is flashing crazy things. Um, yes, I, I I agree with the comment about breathtaking works. Thank you very much. Um, I, a question about uh, you said you had painted in some. Uh, places out of the States, Europe, um, Italy, you were going to Ireland. Uh, do you just paint more landscapes there or uh, do you paint any more buildings? You know, you had buildings more in the background with the skyline, but- Everything. everything. In fact, I don't just paint the river here. I do a lot of other things. I just decided to focus this talk on, you know, that part because it's Fort Hunter group. But you know, I do a lot of, I, I paint all kinds of subjects. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah. Great to know. Uh, another question, have you worked with other mediums outside? Uh, this was oil paint, if I recall. Yes. Right, so the question is, uh, do you, have you worked with other mediums? And if so, are there uh, some that work better than others for painting outside, for example, acrylic paints? Okay. so. I have worked with other mediums, um, but not outside. Ever since I started plein air painting, I just have always used the oils. I, I really like them. And honestly, I feel like I still have a lot more to learn about oil paints, but I have used watercolors and acrylics. I use acrylics a lot for my decorative painting work. Um, and I have pastels that I play with in the studio sometime. So, um, you know, to each his own, that they, they all have different characteristics. Um, I know like, uh, well, when I paint in the winter, people are always wondering if the paints get thick and freeze, but oil paint, um, it gets a little thicker, but it doesn't freeze like, like acrylics or watercolor would. So that's kind of something to consider. Um, but no, I primarily have just done oil outside. Uh, another question, your work is beautiful. It seems there are differences in the amount of detail you capture in various paintings. Is that due to your mood, time available, or something else? Um, yeah, I, a little bit of all of that. And also this uh, presentation had uh, some older work included and some newer work. So uh, you're seeing kind of an evolution, <laughs> but um, yeah. I, that's a good question. I, I, I think sometimes I try to put less detail in, um, you know, and just stop myself when it says what I want to say. Um, but then sometimes it's just, I, I don't have the time and, or it's too cold and I just want to hurry up and get it done. <laughs> so I don't know if that answers your question, but. Uh, do you do cat and dog? I assume that's cat and dog. I've done some animal portraits. Yes. Yes. Um, if you want to check out my website, there's a, several of them, uh, previous commissioned pet portraits on there. Okay. So anybody wants a pet portrait done, check the website and get that contact information. How many colors do you bring with you? Do you tend to mix colors on site? or have pre-mixed colors that you come back to often? That's a good question. Um, so I try to keep a fairly limited palette. I usually have um, uh, like a warm and a cool of each primary color. So like, so it's like six colors plus white and um, usually like a transparent brown. And then sometimes I'll add in uh, extra colors like in the summer, I might add in a brighter green, um, but I do try to mix a lot of colors. Um, some, sometimes with plein air, it, it, there's certain colors that are handy to have just because it's quicker than trying to mix them. 
like yellow ochre, you could mix yellow ochre, but it's sometimes it's easier to just have it in a tube. So um, yeah, and then I, I have colors that, there's some colors that I find myself using too often. So I'll take them off my palette and try to like, if I see it infiltrating my painting too much, I'll remove it from my palette and try to work without it for a while. Thank you. Do you ever put people in your plein air paintings? Yes, I do. In fact, there was a slide um, included in this presentation with some people. But um, yeah, I do. And, and I've painted um, at weddings and live events that have a lot of people. Yeah, I'll comment. I saw that on your website that you do, you know, live painting at the event. So yeah, all of you are planning those reunions and weddings and other big fancy events, you can have somebody come paint the event rather than video it or yeah. maybe have both or something like that. I, I did notice that. Um, could you tell us a little bit about what famous painters might be known for plein air painting or you know that, that was a significant part of their body of work? Well, certainly the French Impressionists, Monet, Van Gogh, um, John Singer Sargent, um, you know, as I mentioned, uh, th that was kind of the heyday of plein air painting, right? you know, so um, the, they, and also they had uh, new colors available, they started making cadmium colors and such, so the, they were able to get more vibrant uh, chroma out of their paintings, so. Um, I would say definitely the French Impressionists. French Impressionists. Are there any disadvantages to paint, painting outside as opposed to in a studio? Well, I know a lot of artists don't like it. Um, I mean, there's a lot of uh, challenges. It's, you know, you're fighting bugs, sun, heat, cold, rain, <laughs> wind. Um, and, you know, a lot of artists like the comfort of their studio. Uh, but I kind of like the challenge of it. And it, it forces me to kind of not spend too long on something. Because when I work in my studio, I tend to overwork things. So I think it's a good way for me um, to get away from that. And just kind of, there aren't as many distractions because I'm there with my paints and it's not like I have other stuff to do, so, yeah. Um, do we have any more questions? I think I've read all of the ones that were, that were uh, here. Do you ever let people watch you paint? Oh yeah, in fact, it, when I do these, um, uh, events, competitions and such, there's, uh, you know, it's all, there's public, uh, the public comes and watches you. Oh, okay. Oh. Yeah, yeah. In fact, there's one, um, Camp Hill has a plein air event. Uh, it's in May. It's a one day, just a Saturday. They call it a quick draw. It's a two hour uh, window that the artist paint on Market Street in Camp Hill and um, if you want to come and you can basically stroll around town and watch all the artists create their works. That sounds exciting. So yeah, it is fun. That's well, I'm sure if you Google that then you'll be able to yeah, find it. Yeah, um, it's put on by downtown Camp Hill. Um, I, I can probably find a date here for you. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure people can find it, um, but I don't see any more questions, but I want to thank you again very much because this was definitely very informative and very interesting. And You're welcome. Uh, thank you. I want to thank everybody for joining us and a few more thank yous are popping into the chat. Uh, so I think people are joining me in, in expressing our gratitude and all of our listeners, don't forget when the 
signups are available for you to do the free registration for February 21st, please do that. And uh, um, we will look forward to seeing you on that day. And uh, hopefully we'll have a few more to finish out the spring of 24 before we end for the summer. Uh, lots of thank yous are, are popping up. So thank you again, Julie, and thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you everyone. And have a good evening. All right.